everybody. Welcome to Building Cross-Chain Value. We have a bunch of great speakers today. Um, I'd like to introduce Jay, VP of Marketing at Ava Labs, Jimmy Chang, the Product Manager at Aave, and Michael, COO of Ren Labs. Please, everybody, give them a warm welcome for being here today. So I just want this panel to be very open format. Feel free to just have open dialogue, conversate. Don't have to uh, answer the questions directly. Just here to hear your insights. So to start off, number one, the question. I will memorize these one day. Um, <laughs> what is something in general that you've just completely missed in life? Like you're just, you're just wrong. Like you're so passionate about it, but you, you, just, you just got it wrong. Um, happy to start with Jay. Yeah, so I don't know if this is something I'm passionate about, but I was definitely wrong about COVID. So I think it, everyone Agree there. probably relate to that, maybe. And if you were right. <laughs> um, and then in the crypto context, maybe one thing was uh, metaverses. Uh, I don't think I was necessarily bearish on the idea, but early days, um, I know I think most of us have, have pretty deep backgrounds in the space, rel relatively speaking. You saw the user experience, and you're, you're really playing around with... Um, I don't know, say something like Decentraland, and you're kind of looking around and you're saying, well, we're clearly early, so I'm not really sure, I can't really see what the future looks like. I think right now we've accelerated quite a bit. The infrastructure is much stronger. I think the user experience is much better, still has a ton to improve, um, but I think it's much better. So if now I'm kind of turning the page a little bit and saying, all right, well, maybe, maybe there is something here, but I'm not exactly sure what that is actually for what it's worth. Yeah, care to elaborate? Yeah, mine mine would be actually very similar to, to Jay's uh, COVID, definitely. I was like, it's going to be over in two weeks. Definitely, no big deal. Uh, but yeah, obviously it didn't happen. Um, and I think uh, NFTs being the vehicle for, for public kind of adoption or public recognition of crypto over the last, you know, five to six months, I would have kind of scoffed at the idea, to be honest with you, and completely wrong. So yeah, I'm definitely uh, coming around to that. How about you, Jimmy? I would say... In a general sense, I was really wrong about not having a healthy relationship with my parents, uh, but that's a lot to unpack <laughs> at a happy hour. Uh, but yes. I'm working through it. Uh, but from a crypto sense, uh, I was super, super wrong about CryptoPunks. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, they were, they were even nothing uh, like this time last year. I remember people were like talking about nifties. That's what they called them last year. It was like a rebrand uh, that, off, that hope, you know, luckily died. Uh, and I was like, eh, like, I don't really know. Like, I'm really, like, really into DeFi. I'm really into payments, like financial services. Like, I don't really think this like CryptoPunks NFT thing is going to be like a big thing, right? And so obviously Definitely. a year later, I like have a lot of NFTs and have capitulated a lot. Yeah, I feel like generally a lot of people in the DeFi space didn't really see the whole NFT craze coming like as big as it did, but happy it did on for so many people. So on the flip side, what's something that you got right while building Ave, Ren, and Ava Labs? Yeah, happy to start. Um, I think one thing we did really well and, and timed really well uh, is, is interoperability. We started off as a dark pool protocol and then kind of uh, evolved into an interoper interoperability protocol it kind of uh, spring 2019, um, and then built our product, and then really May 2020 is when we released RenBM, um, and that's when we saw DeFi Summer kick off. That's when we saw BTC or wrapped BTC variants really picking up as collateral within the DeFi ecosystem, um, and we we actually you know helped catalyze that. You know you can see WBTC's growth along with RenBTC's growth really kick off around June 2020. Um, so that's something, uh, yeah, we, we definitely got right. So we're excited for it. <clears throat> yeah, maybe for us, um, in the Avalanche context, I think what generally worked out was leaning into what was already strong and not trying to reinvent the wheel. So I think specifically having the EVM run on Avalanche, I think that was the biggest play. Uh, for, for some time, it actually didn't seem like it was going to pay off, at least for the year. And in a bull market, that year is probably 10 years. So it really felt like a long time. Um, but now you're really seeing developers, especially people that are building, saying, all right, well, I already know Solidity. I already know all the tools that are here. So why would I relearn something that I just learned maybe three, four years ago? Instead, they're able to port over their applications. And I think that's really minimizing the time to market. So I think that's something that's really important. And then broadly speaking, UX. I think UX is uh, something that's super important. I know we've been talking about it a lot. I, we know each other from uh, previous roles, too. Um, and so right now, I think what's happening is 
the obscuring of the complexities of blockchain. Um, you're starting to see that with things like Topshot. You're starting to see that, um, and, and not, not necessarily implemented in the best way, I guess, in the kind of most decentralized way, but I actually have the stance that it doesn't necessarily have to be like that on day one. Hopefully in the future, we'll strive to, to kind of meet that, that, those metrics, but right now it's kind of like, uh, you kind of need to start jogging before you start sprinting. So um, kind of leaning into to, to what's strong, I guess, is the, the takeaway. Yeah, super important. Um, I think one thing that we got right um, from building the Aave protocol is trusting our community. And so building a right on-chain governance structure uh, that allows for everyone to feel empowered to actually keep the safety and the integrity of the protocol. And so now we have a very vibrant ecosystem of contributors who are very, very aligned on making sure that the Aave protocol is safe, right? And we have a very um, growing ecosystem of sub DAOs that are really invested into this. And so we have the, you know, the risk DAO that is, is getting spun up. We have the grant style. We want a dev DAO eventually as well. And so, um, you know, being the core team is just one of many very, very interested and powerful stakeholders in uh, governing the Aave uh, protocol. And that's something that I'm like super, super proud of. Awesome. And maybe this will be helpful for people who are a little bit newer to crypto, but would you guys mind explaining, you know, what, what your project does specifically and how it has any unique value prop? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, so yeah, as, as noted, uh, we're an interoperability protocol. Our product's called RenVM. And essentially what we do is take Bitcoin, which is a standalone blockchain, and then allow it to function on Ethereum as an ERC-20. So you can think of it in a very simple terms as an adapter that takes, you know, Bitcoin, which is a, actually a, a very good example. It's like Mac and Windows. They just don't communicate, right? They're two different operating systems. So we've essentially allowed or created a bridge in between the two that allow the two to communicate. So we take Bitcoin, which is its own operating system, essentially, and then we bridge it over to Ethereum as a wrapped asset. And then it's, a, it's an ERC-20, so you can go and take it and do whatever you want. You can loan it out as collateral. You can trade it for, you know, an ERC-20 like DAI. Um, so that's essentially what we've uh, released uh, back in back in May 2020. And to date, we've done almost $9 million in volume. Um, so it's been been really successful. So yeah, um, that's that's Remedy in a nutshell. Yeah, very impressive. For, for Avalanche, Avalanche is a layer one with smart contracts. And so like I mentioned before, it has the EVM running on it. That's effectively the proof of concept for this for this uh, function called subnets. So Avalanche can eventually horizontally scale where you have all these different types of VMs. So you could have like a Solana VM, you could have any other chain that I guess needs scalability uh, solutions to work and also interoperate is, interoperate is kind of like the next step. So the focus for us has really been smart contract enabled applications. DeFi was kind of the first uh, area that we were tackling and then NFTs and then gaming and social tokens, all these things started coming into the surface uh, the last two, three years, at least more strongly than ever before. And so now we've really broadened the scope and saying, all right, well, which application, it doesn't matter if it's DeFi or gaming, which one needs high performance blockchains? And I think in the future, we're gonna see uh, probably some problems pop up that we have to figure out just from a scalability uh, perspective, maybe also user experience. So right now, right as we've grown, um, so mainnet launch was September 2020, since then, just a quick stat, uh, August this past summer, Avalanche, uh, t if you were to use TVL as a metric, there was about 200 million total value locked on Avalanche. Today, we're at about 15 billion. So it's only been about four months and a lot of activity has been pouring into the ecosystem. So you're gonna see a lot of different things that happen and I think those are excellent learning opportunities for the team to figure out what the users, also the developers, want out of a platform um, that enables smart contracts. Yeah, before I talk about um, what me and my team are involved with, I just want to say like it's super dope to be on this panel because like I think what you guys are building are just like super sick. Avalanche is a horizontally scalable modular blockchain. That's super dope. Ren is super important in terms of trustless bridges in this modular future. So uh, super dope to be here. Thanks, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so so me so. Uh, I work uh, at a entity called Ave Companies, which is kind of a interesting, uh, kind of weird way to describe it. But that, the reason why we call it that is because we, we are multi-protocol, we want to be multi-protocol. And so um, obviously the most uh, prescient one and, and the most kind of relevant one to this conversation is the Aave protocol, uh, which we built uh, a few years ago um, as a kind of extension of ETHLEN, which was built a few years back uh, before that. But basically what it is, is it's a, li a liquidity protocol. And so uh, it's basically, 
a way for people to uh, pool their assets and also uh, borrow or um, like take um, like certain positions against those assets. And so a, a pretty standard use case is like someone is able to deposit their collateral uh, from a crypto sense, you know, anywhere from like the majors of stables to various, uh, you know, wrap BTC, run BTC, uh, ETH, various kind of wrap versions of ETH and earns uh, kind of yield against it. And where does that yield come from? It comes from people who are actually interested in uh, borrowing it, whether they want to go uh, long something in terms of leverage or they want to go short against a position or they just want liquidity against your collateral. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we're, we're also on Avalanche, uh, super fortunate. Uh, we have $3 uh, billion of TLV there, a uh, TVL. And then we're total, I think we're about uh, at a certain point. I think we're 25 right now, but at a certain point we were at 30 billion. Uh, TVL, so that was really cool. Um, and then, why did I start with the weird Ave companies kind of preface? Uh, it's because we're the first organization that I'm proud of to be building multiple protocols. And so we're working on a social media protocol for what Web3 Social looks like in a crypto native sense. Uh, I also run a team called Loot, Newt, which is our experiments arm. And so we're kind of pushing the forefront of novel NFTs and zero knowledge. Uh, scaling with uh, computation scaling with uh, MEV searchers and kind of improving that experience. And so, uh, yeah, uh, that's kind of uh, what we're doing in a nutshell, uh, in addition to a bunch of other crap like NFTs as collateral and uh, yeah, a lot of stuff. So we're, we're having fun in uh, Ave companies. Awesome. So a big reason that we throw these events is to educate people more about how Chainlink's used. We are agnostic. So I'd love to hear from you guys you know, how Chainlink is implemented into your technologies. Happy to start, same order. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we use uh, Chainlink for actually two very important things. Uh, first, Oracle's for our assets. So if we have run BTC on a particular blockchain, uh, we need basically uh, an, an Oracle for that asset. Um, so that's, you know, we use those for all of our assets. I think now we have 25 in total that we bridge. Um, so we'll be using Chainlink for all of those. So thank you guys. Thank you. Uh, uh, and then second of all, we have something called proof of reserve. So back to describing how RenVM works, to, to bridge an asset to another blockchain, we actually, we custodial the asset. So we take Bitcoin, we custodial it and then mint a one-for-one -one representation on Ethereum, for example. And so proof of reserve is actually this, this product that essentially pings our wallet, essentially, uh, that says, okay, RenVM, the protocol has X amount of Bitcoin in it. So you can always verify that it actually has one-to-one -one custodial ship of the assets that are bridged across various blockchains. Um, so yeah, it goes without saying, but Chainlink has been great. So appreciate Thank it, guys. You. Okay. Yeah, I think with us it's a little bit different. It's more for the applications that are building on Avalanche. So it's basically Oracle function for, for those applications. What's actually funny is I, I can't remember when Chainlink went live on Avalanche mainnet, but there are probably 10, 15 projects that we were working with directly from the Avalabs team who are saying, all right, well, we can't deploy actually until Chainlink is live. So it was, I think you guys actually were, were part of them too. I can't remember. Yeah, exactly. Um, but that's, that's kind of the basic function there. I know there's a few other uh, products that are coming online, so hopefully we can get those integrated and, and again, mostly for the application side. Very cool. Yeah, Chainlink's a super important partner when we think about uh, the Aave protocol and going um, multi-chain uh, in collaboration with, you know, amongst the other contributors uh, in the protocol ecosystem. Um, and we kind of use it for, for two main reasons. Uh, the first one is obviously we use it for price feeds. And so when you think about this two-sided liquidity pool and there are people collateralizing their crypto and taking you know, positions in you know, a different uh, currency on top of it, uh, there needs to be a price feed in order to determine you know, what is the liquidation threshold or what is like the loan to value ratio in order for it to be a good debt, right? And so without getting too much into it, uh, a lot of you know, crypto um, kind of uh, liquidity primitives like use a chain leak in order to have this like healthy ratio between how much you collateralize versus how much you, you borrow against it. And so that's, that's kind of the, the main use case. And then when we think about it from an experiments perspective, I think VRF is a really interesting use case when you think about raffles or general randomization of how you want to distribute whatever kind of reward or whatever kind of gamification element you want to add to the experiment. So those are kind of like the two ways that we use Chainlink. And uh, yeah, it's a super helpful uh, tool and, and partner to be in as we think about going multi-chain. Yep, we appreciate you using us, so thank you. And Jimmy, just to stick on with you, um, would you mind explaining a little bit about your cross-chain strategy? Why did you decide to go to Polygon Avalanche um, from Ethereum? 
Yeah, so I'm laughing because this isn't really, I'm not really like the person that was like, let's do this, you know? Uh, and, and it kind of made it happen. But uh, how we view it at uh, Ave um, is uh, we're definitely EVM maxis. Uh, we support EVM. We think it is definitely a very important foundation for building in Web3 and crypto broadly. Uh, and so within that kind of uh, space, like what makes sense from a uh, user need and a liquidity perspective and an ecosystem perspective in order to actually um, be very valuable in, in those different chains. And so for us right now, we're, we're deployed on three chains. You know, we're on Ethereum mainnet, uh, we're on Avalanche, and we're on Polygon. And uh, you know, in the future, we're going to use the same framework in order to assess, OK, what does it make sense to go to another EVM-compatible chain? Definitely. Well said. Um, let's jump over to, let's talk about Avalanche Labs. So when somebody else wants to build on you, um, is, there any, is there anything that, like, are there any red lights? Do you get nervous? Or is it just green lights, full steam ahead, ready to go, work the integration? Yeah, so I mean, at the end of the day, uh, permissionless blockchains, you can't really have control over what gets deployed. So all things considered, it, it is like any, anyone should be deploying um, if, if they want to. At least when it comes to the Ava Labs engagement, what we're really looking for are some of the novel uh, new applications that aren't, uh, aren't, I guess, kind of like the repeat of the past. And so the reason why that's important is because we're still really early to the game. So only been about um, a year and change on mainnet. A lot of the early apps that came on board were the ones that existed on Ethereum, were the ones that existed on other chains. Um, and so that's where I think we started to build up the base. Once the base has been built, then a lot of these applications who are saying, all right, well, we actually need a fast chain to function at all and haven't really deployed on any chain, that's, those are the kind of ones that we want to engage. So that's where I think our BD team, marketing has a place. I think everyone actually has a hand in this too, for what it's worth. But um, we're always talking to these products and applications saying, what's, what's your end goal? Uh, if, if you want to bootstrap development, then maybe the foundation could be helping you guys with funding or, or marketing or something in between. Um, but if there's something where it's like, maybe it's uh, users and, and retail traders, maybe there's a broader story to be told here. So actually, um, with you guys, with Aave, uh, we, we, and a few other um, Ethereum native apps at the time, we ran this incentive pro program called Avalanche Rush. The way I describe it to, to people that don't necessarily know the crypto space, it's kind of like when Uber and Lyft came to the cities and started to give everybody those free rides. That's where we're at now. And when I get asked, hey, do you think, well, once the well dries up, then does everyone leave? Well, it, everyone will leave only if the UX and the product experience was, was bad. And so they came in for the money and they'll leave. But if there's actually something there that's useful for the user, whether that's high performance, low cost, or something, in the, it, it, could, it could even be as, as um, non-technical as community, uh, or it could be something like the color of the token. It really could be as silly as that. Um, and I think that's what's going to get the users to stay. And I think once the, the incentive programs kind of start tapering away, you'll, you'll see that the strong base starts shining through. Awesome. So, Ren, a question for you. So, since you're the early pioneer of making the token bridges possible, what are some lessons that you've learned that you could share with everybody here as, you know, these projects, they might find valuable as this becomes a continuous trend? Yeah, great, great question. And uh, yeah, we've had to build a lot of things ourselves. So I think there's two just because there wasn't precedence before. And I think that that's taken us a long time. And then we've learned a lot as a result. But I think two things stand out. First is, is node infrastructure. So we're bridging assets that are outside of the EVM world. So we need to run either a full node or an RPC endpoint for Bitcoins, you know, like all the legacy assets we support, Zcash, Filecoin, all these guys have their own node infrastructures. So for us to actually operate, we need to build these essentially yeah, node infrastructure in-house for it to work. Um, and that's taken us a lot of time, uh, as well as you know, blockchains that are outside of the EVM world, like Solana, for example. We've had to, again, build our own in-house blockchain infrastructure. Uh, for, for that. Um, so it's, it's been difficult because no third party provided those, those services. Like Inferior was just Ethereum. And like now there's Block Daemon and a few others that are providing kind of these services across the board. Um, but we have, you know, that, that's just coming about and they still don't support all the blockchains that we, that we do. Um, so yeah, we've had to build everything in house. So if you want to go outside of EVM, uh, be prepared to do it in house or, you know, lean on a third party service. 
And I think something to keep in mind, at least for us, you have to trust them explicitly if you use a third party. Um, because they can, you know, kind of like spoof transactions, and then that would actually trigger, you know, rent to mint uh, an arbitrary amount of, of an asset that actually isn't there if someone p spoofed a transaction. So uh, it's it's tricky, and you have to basically, you know, trust these guys explicitly if you do use a third party. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind if you you move outside of the EVM world. Um, yeah, so for, yeah, for cross-chain, that's, that's definitely something to keep in mind. And then number two would be UX, uh, and especially, again, outside of EVM, you know, you're sending Bitcoin in and you want to mint it on Solana, and it's like, you know, you have to have, uh, there's just so many issues. If basically, if a user can screw it up, they will. And we've had to <laughs> basically refine our product in a way that it's like, step one, only do this. Step two, only do this and make it wicked simple for the end user or otherwise they'll screw it up. Um, so making sure UX is as clean and as simple as possible in, in the cross-chain uh, world is, is so important. Um, you know, we've had to scale our own customer service team just to deal with the inquiries we get. They're like, oh, I've sent in Bitcoin and I saw gas was $100, so I rejected it. Now my Bitcoin's gone. What do I do? You know, and we're like, oh, God, yeah. You know? uh, so, you know, and we can, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, uh, we have an ability to resolve that, but nonetheless, it happens all the time, and especially for new users. Um, so you really need to think about the user experience and making it as full foolproof as, as possible um, when, when you're working in, in the cross-chain space. So, yeah, node infrastructure and dead simple UX are two things you definitely need to keep in mind. Maybe just quickly to add, because it's really interesting that we have literally four different things that all work together in order to make it work. And so, just like to expound on my answer earlier, uh, tooling is so important when we think about going multi-chain, right? And so me, I'm, you know, we're working on building and making improvements to a smart contract protocol, then we have a blockchain protocol, and then we have um, a bridging infrastructure in a decentralized manner, and then we have oracles, right? Like those all need to work together in order to like actually work. Uh, so it's, it's, it's cool to have it like all come together because without that, without even like the graph for, you know, Aave protocols perspective, to have good indexing for data, like we can't deploy, right? So that's that's super important for everyone to realize that like we're all like working together to make sure thriving ecosystems happen in various uh, various places. Definitely. Does anybody? That's all the questions I have for right now. Do you guys have anything to add or sum up with? Otherwise, we'll jump to the Q and A. Um, just want to thank you. It's awesome to be on stage with you guys. These are pioneers of the industry. I went from you know being a kind of a crypto cheerleader to working full time in it now, and it's incredible, and I look forward to working together, you know, change the world. So with that said, we're gonna open it up to Q&A, but I would love it if last night got a little, a little rowdy, so if we could keep it to one question, um, that would be great. <laughs> so uh, for the Q&A, to get the most people possible, please keep it to one question and one answer. If you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to ask the panelists uh, after the panel. Thank you. Hey, uh, what are your favorite projects for cross-chain bridges? What, what was the question? Uh, what are your favorite projects that uh, you are watching for cross-chain bridges tokens? Yeah, so there, I mean, there's us. Obviously, I'm a little biased, but uh, <laughs> yeah, outside of outside of RenVM, I mean, there's a lot of great products coming out. I mean, Hot Protocol looks really cool in their UX. They're doing the UX very well, um, and, and we appreciate that. Uh, there's AnySwap. You know, those guys are doing great things. Um, they've done a, a fair amount of volume uh, within the EVM space. Um, so those are two guys that we we definitely keep an eye out on. Um, yeah, they, they have great UX, and it's something we uh, we want to learn from. Um, I really like Layer Zero. Um, they're really interesting because, you know, um, they have this like novel structure of having oracles and relayers basically like push block headers and also push transaction data in like on like, you know, like on demand basically uh, to different protocols. And so you don't have to run full nodes in order to have trustless communication. So. Very early days for it, but I think that's going to open up way more potential for bridges because you know the, the the requirement to run either a full node or have like a super expensive light node uh, becomes vastly vastly smaller. So super 
dope stuff. Yeah, and maybe for me, I, I just looked at Layer Zero like last week, funny enough. Um, but optics I've been looking at as well. They're out of Celo, um, Celo Labs. The main thing that I care about, um, and I, I don't have a technical development background, is, is something that uh, makes it really easy, but also secure. So like what Michael said, uh, if a user can make that mistake, then they're going to make it. So I basically go through from the experience side and then go into the documentation of how that works and then basically ask probably half the room here how this actually works on the hood. So if all those check boxes are checked off, then I think that that's a viable product. But even then, it really you don't really have that uh, provability until it's live. So that's kind of the risk of, of the space that we're in. Awesome. A lot of alpha there. Um, any other questions? Quick question for uh, Ava Labs for a sec. Um, don't worry. Um, so as there's all these different mainnets out there, like between Phantom, Harmony One, like Avalanche, Solana, what's like the bi biggest differentiating factor of Avalanche to bring on new users uh, relative to all these other chains? Yeah, I think the biggest one that we've been leaning on is transaction finality. Uh, I think there's going to be a certain point in time where transaction finality speeds from a consensus level will be at at uh, just such a undifferentiated time, uh, I guess, horizon where under a second, the human's not going to really uh, feel that difference. So I think right now we're really taking advantage of that because most of the other blockchains are pushing 5, 20 seconds or, or greater than that. That's kind of the first one. Maybe the other angle, um, and I've actually talked to a bunch of friends at Solana um, about this as well, is Solana and Avalanche, the way we're structured, we have a core team that's building the, the product right now or the platform. That, the way it's centralized, I think actually is a strength in a way, because you're able to communicate, coordinate with, the, with your team members as a proper company, as opposed to, I don't know, early days of a DAO, how, do, how does that really work? Uh, also, having it super remote, I'm, I'm actually totally fine with that, but also adds some complexities as well with time zone difference and stuff. So you're, you'll see from both teams, uh, just kind of the, the pace at which we're attacking the market because it is so competitive um, is, is actually at, at a really high rate. And I really do believe that's, that's just because of the, the traditional structure that we've kind of um, gone to, towards, at least in the beginning. Thank you. I know there's a question in the front. Hi, uh, my name is Deshaun Bledsoe. No, Lauren, Lauren, Lauren. Yep. Are you, you, would you, uh, somebody in the back first? Only, we can give it to Deshaun and then we can go in the back. My name is Deshaun Butso, uh, National Ice World League Sport Coin. Um, I'm a founder. Um, I actually created a sport league uh, based on biometrics. Um, we're using blockchain hardware or whatever to discover athletes um, and then also collecting, tracking, measuring uh, athletic data on blockchain. So my question to you guys today is based on uh, regulatory. Um, what do you feel about regulatory today, and what do you think things are going? Because uh, I'm, I'm a founder. I just started this company in 2018. Um, I'm going on four years right now. I'm still looking for seed capital. And they're talking about killing cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. If anybody feels comfortable answering any questions about yeah, regulatory Yeah, happy issues. to. I mean, at a high level, and I mean, I'm not I'm obviously not a lawyer, but at a high level, I think all of us were at the protocol level. So we're really just running the kind of transaction layer so there will you know all of us have products that are built on top of our protocols so you know we'll have uh, you know we'll have applications that do have KYC and they'll have you know and these are the front ends these are the websites that actually users interact with that they'll you know they'll be in a particular jurisdiction and that jurisdiction requires that they do have KYC for whatever reason and that can be built on top of our protocol I mean we're just basically crunching the numbers I guess is, is a good way to put it um, and so that's like we're agnostic, essentially, from a regulatory perspective. Like you can have a, a product that doesn't have KYC or a product that does have KYC, and it can all be built on top of our protocol. At least, I mean, I can speak to our protocol, at least, but I think the, uh, the same applies to you guys as well. Um, I know, like, uh, Ave has, you know, two, two kind of, they've, you know, allowed a product that does have KYC and one that doesn't. And I think that's, that's the way of the future. I mean, to, you can't really, uh, you know, you can't really skirt regulation. It would be silly to, to think you can. So building uh, a flexible system that can, that can function in both worlds, I think, is, is the most crucial thing you can do moving forward. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Andy. Uh, I don't know if this uh, question, to like 
uh, any of you guys can answer it, but uh, regarding cross-chain value and interoperability, uh, can you like elaborate more on NFTs as collateral and DeFi 2.0? Sorry, Thank what you. was the second part? ETH 2.0? Oh, DeFi 2.0. Yeah, I can talk about that. Um, sorry, I don't, I don't quite get the question. Maybe it's like a little too broad, but I will interpret it the way that I can. Um, DeFi is the foundation of what we're building. It is as foundational as any blockchain protocol or any decentralized bridging mechanism or any rollup. Why is that the case? Because we're gonna have an app layer that is going to look very, very different than I think what we're familiar with today. And so right now we have apps that are basically very simply using the smart contract functions that we have, at least you know, in Aave's example, or even for Uniswap or, or Compound or, or anything like that. Um, and uh, what's gonna happen is you don't have to do that one-to-one. -one. You can actually build an application layer that's able to leverage that within your own use case and you can like own uh, you know, the design and user experience. And so what does that look like in the world of NFTs? And what does that look like in the world of games and gaming economies and DAO ecosystems, DAO to DAO swaps, treasury management? At the end of the day, People want to earn yield, people want liquidity, people want to swap between different assets. And to have a vision of like an open liquidity order book, for lack of better terms, is like super important. And you can like tag in that different ways. And so, sorry, that, that was kind of a, a weird preface. But basically, to answer your question, NFTs will play to that, right? Eventually, you want liquidity for NFTs, you either want to collateralize it or you want to swap it, you want to earn yield, like you want to use it the same way as you use an ERC-20 or a similar token in this DeFi ecosystem that we're building right now. And so that's how I view it. And that's something that we're marching towards at Aave is, is building that connection layer as a reference implementation for a bunch of other people to also do that so that people are not down bad on their liquid JPEGs and they can actually like get some liquidity for it, right? So that's, that's really important. On DeFi 2.0, I mean, DeFi 2.0 is like interesting marketing for basically an idea of like, how do you have better, how do you improve upon the incentive experimentation that we've had so far with DeFi 1.0 or DeFi summer last, last year with liquidity mining and yield farming and stuff like that, right? So how do you have like protocol owned liquidity or how do you have uh, AMM owned liquidity and also like other novel ways of like basically incentivizing people to like not dump their bags, right? <laughs> For lack of a better term. Uh, and so how does that play into this world that I'm picturing? Uh, it pictures a world where it's like, Liquidity isn't mercenary and doesn't is, is predictable, right? You have an inch, you have a a set idea of like what your slippage or what your access to certain assets are going to be, especially as we have a long tail of like more tokens for gaming economies or NFTs that are uh, way more illiquid and have different kind of risk curves than a, a standard kind of ERC twenty token. And so that's how I think it plays into it. And I think a lot of people are experimenting on what that looks like, whether it be protocol on liquidity with Olympus and all its you know a million forks or it's with liquidity mining 2.0 that Andre Cronier proposed with option liquidity mining or uh, you, know, uh, option, you know, like liquidity mining 3.0 which has to do with coverage protocols and insurance premiums. So everyone's experimenting on this but I think we're all marching towards the same beat of the drum of like, we need to fix this. This is not the right vision that we're trying to march towards. Thank you. All right, one more question. Hi, can you hear me? Good. We can hear you. Hey, uh, my name is Crypto Excel, and I have a question for Ren, but a general question across the board about decentralization in bridging. Specifically in Ren, is it Shamir's key sharding, or is it a full multi-party compute? And if it's the former and not the latter, then how is the original key generated? Because I have some questions about the centralization around the generation of that key. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, so we use mere secret sharing and SMPC as well uh, in unison um, to actually generate the keys. So, we, you know, you take in an asset like Bitcoin uh, and, and basically, you know, run me the network custodials that and then breaks up basically the, the, th the simple way to think about it is it breaks up the private key into small little pieces. And then anytime Renvium wants to mint, like mint or burn or spend an asset, it reconvenes that key, and then it's and then the network is given permission to spend the asset, and that's absolutely crucial to to our vision. Um, and I mean, we've taken 
particular caution to actually implementing that in the, in the long run? Because, I mean, as you've seen, I mean, things get hacked all the time. If you rush that type of stuff, you can get hacked if you make a mistake. You know, we've seen Keeper, uh, the Keep Network and TBTC, I mean, they made a mistake in one of the original lines of code and, you know, they actually had to kind of like reboot their protocol. So we've been very cautious. And then, you know, the, the plan we take is something called progressive decentralization. So we're testing kind of, uh, you know, testing a few nodes running at a time, then we open it up to a larger set of the public, and then eventually it's opened up to even you know, the, the general public, so anyone in the world can run a node that runs SMPC and so the Shamir secret uh, sharing portion of the protocol. Um, we've got Jazz here, actually, uh, our, our CTO, <laughs> and uh, so he, he'd be glad to speak to you about that uh, after this as well. Yeah, thank you. Guys. All right, I, I have one question for Jimmy. Do I have to go to Rave to get one of those hats? Yes. Understood. All right. Thank you guys for all coming out. I know there's a million things you could be doing tonight, but you're here with us um, learning how to build. So I thank you for that. Everybody enjoy their night, and I'll see you at DeFiCon tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thanks, thank everyone. You.